ladies and gentlemen, it is no joke and it is widely known that the global uh, community is facing an energy problem. With a growing population that's going to reach 9 billion by 2050, when oil is going to run out of this, on this planet by 2050, we acknowledge that we have to look towards alternative energy resources so we can provide the global energy demand for the future. Now, we believe that this motion is essentially about team opposition proving to us that we can still harness the, or that we can still harness alternatives to nuclear energy and provide the global energy demand for the future, let's say for the next hundreds of years, without the use of nuclear energy. But what exactly is nuclear energy in this motion? We believe that nuclear energy simply refers to the commercial production of, uh, of power through either the use of fission or fusion. So, we believe that team proposition has to prove to you today simply one thing. That we, can, that we cannot simply provide the global energy demand without the use of nuclear energy. And that the renewable energy sources, which is probably what team opposition is going to be advocating for, are not enough. I'll be talking to you about how there's no feasible solutions to providing the global energy demand for the future without nuclear energy. Whereas my second speaker, Dalma, will be talking to you more about the developing world and technological developments within nuclear energy and, and how they will pretty much uh, make for a brighter future. So, you know, let's go into my first argument already about how there are no feasible alternatives. I divided this argument up into three parts. Firstly, how, how about fossil fuels, the most prominent use of energy right now that we have is not sustainable for the future. Secondly, how renewable energy sources, although are very good, they are just simply not enough. And thirdly, how we can tackle these problems that the fossil fuels and the renewable energy problems have with nuclear energy. I'll take you now, sir. But sir, when we see that nuclear energy poses such big risks, why would we bother taking these risks when we have things like hydroelectricity that can go in and don't pose the risk of nuclear waste? Uh, thank you very much, sir. I'm going to, I was actually going to go into this idea about hydroelectric power and so forth in my second point. But the idea about risk, we acknowledge. There are risks to nuclear energy, but we believe that vast benefits and energy that we get from nuclear energy production simply outweigh those risks, such as waste and possible meltdowns in the future. So let's go into, into my first point about the problems with fossil fuels, uh, as I already outlined. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, they're extremely harmful for the, for the environment through greenhouse gas emissions. Pretty much we all know that when we emit greenhouse gases such as CO2, we ruin the ozone layer in the atmosphere. Now this is pretty, pretty much simple science. As the, as the light or the heat from the sun goes into Earth, it, it pretty much uh, heats up objects on Earth. Those objects heat pretty much radiate infrared radiation back out into the atmosphere. However, that radiation is trapped in the, in, in the atmosphere due to the sort of uh, greenhouse gases that we have in the ozone layers because they simply do not let them back out. Now, we also believe that this is obviously one of the reasons why we have global warming. So for nuclear energy, which has zero greenhouse gas emissions, we believe we can solve this problem. And we can eliminate like pretty much 30% of the global energy use, which is fossil fuels, and in the near future at least replace it with nuclear energy. And secondly, we all know that we will run out of fossil fuels in the near future. I already told you how we will, we, we will reach peak oil by 2050. <laughs> now, what will we use if not oil? Well, obviously, we know that you can't power cars really on maybe solar energy or wind power. So uh, we would like to see maybe Team Opposition give us some kind of like solution to how maybe we could power these. So let's move on to my next point. No, thank you, sir. About renewables, how, uh, although they are very beneficial to the environment, they are simply not enough. One of the first reasons for this is that they are extremely expensive as of now. They cost, uh, let's see, the, the average nuclear power plant costs around $4 billion to build and it will last for 25 to 30 of years, right? To harness, like this nuclear power plant will literally harness the same amount of energy as pretty much like uh, if you put like wind or solar panels in a state the size of like Nebraska or something like that, which is pretty much a really, really huge area. So not only do we see that we save money on nuclear energy, we see we also save space. No, thank you, sir. Secondly, we believe that renewable energies are not really a viable solution because they're entirely dependent on weather conditions. Take, for example, solar power. We can't provide uh, regions which have, really little, uh, which have really little sun a year, such as Sweden, uh, with um, solar power. No, thank you. No. And, for example, in countries where you don't have as much wind, you cannot really provide a, a, or, uh, provide a global energy demand or the regional energy demand with these resources. So we'd like to see like, a response from team opposition, how they plan to combat this issue about the unpredictability of weather. Now, thirdly, my point about renewables is that they're entirely inefficient, despite being really uh, good for the environment. There's something called energy density, which is pretty much the amount of energy you can receive from a certain grammar, certain amount of uh, input energy. So, 
uh, let's say that you have like one gram of coal or something, and then the, you get like 70% of the energy within that substance out from burning it, yeah? The problem with uh, wind and solar power is that only like less than 20% less than of the input energy that you put into solar panels and into wind power, uh, wind turbines, actually produce useful energy. So they're really inefficient. We'd like to see a response from team opposition and how, about how they plan to make these renewable sources no efficient. I'll take an answer. But so if we were able to use a lot of renewable energies together, such as solar and wind at the same time, why can't we use this instead of harming our environment with nuclear energy? Okay, firstly, we'd like you to prove how we are harming the environment through nuclear energy besides this idea of waste or meltdowns because these rarely, rarely happen. And secondly, when it comes to renewable energy, I think I already outlined to you how they're extremely inefficient and they rely on weather conditions. So you can't provide the, the uh, regional energy demand of any region with even if you combine all these resources. Now, let's move on to my last point of this argument about nuclear energy solves most of these problems. Like I said, we acknowledge the risks of this, but we believe the benefits severely outweigh the problems of waste and potential meltdowns. So, firstly, we know there's zero emissions because you know what? This this sort of uh, smoke or whatever that you see coming from nuclear energy uh, power plants isn't actually smoke; it's steam because you use water in nuclear power plants to control uh, pretty much the nuclear reactions within within the nuclear reactors. Now, secondly, when it comes to waste, we don't see this as a problem because we see there is current technology being developed to handle waste. We, for example, place lots of waste in salt mines nowadays where the radiation is contained and it's not a big problem. Thirdly, as already outlined, nuclear energy is extremely cheap. It costs roughly 25 US cents per kilowatt hour, whereas renewable energy sources cost almost $2. So we see that renewable energy in most cases is, is almost as eight times as expensive as nuclear energy. Now, as Fourthly, as I already explained to you, this idea about uh, nuclear, uh, I'm sorry, energy density is a scientific fact that nuclear, uh, nuclear materials such as uranium has the highest energy density of any substance on this planet. So we think it would be irresponsible to not take advantage of such useful uh, materials or resources that we have on this earth. And lastly, we, I told you that we have a problem with finite resources. Well, you know what? We know that nuclear energy is a finite resource. We do not have infinite uranium. But the thing is, we have scientists who actually told us that we, if we continue the rate of development of nuclear technology as it is now, and we use nuclear energy even as of the current technology we have now, we will be able to use the uranium we have as of now for thousands of years to come. And we think that's the, that is a reasonable definition of the future, right? If we can provide the global energy demand for thousands of years. So because we believe that nuclear energy is the only way to solving the global energy demand for the reasons that, that I outlined, and because they provide for sustainable development to the fact that they do not produce such huge environmental risks, we believe that there actually is no future without the use of nuclear energy. Thank you. Gentlemen, we see that France has already vowed to close all 40 of their nuclear power plants in response to the Fukushima nuclear disaster that happened in 2011. We see that even the developed nations, let alone the developing nations, are buying out and realizing the dangers of nuclear energy, which is why we on side opposition are so proud to oppose the resolution this house believes that there is no future without nuclear energy. All right, now the first thing that we would take contention with to what side opposition, sorry, what side proposition has told us is their definition of nuclear energy. And they've said that nuclear energy is like the energy produced by either fission or fusion. We'd like to point out that fusion actually isn't possible on Earth right now. We've tried, it doesn't exist, it only works on the sun. We said that that part of their definition has a couple of flaws in that. Furthermore, we take contention to what their points have been. We think that they haven't really focused on a key part of the definition, which is what they mean by no future. We think that they've made it a, like a debate of whether or not nuclear energy is good. We'd like to see them focus more on the whole aspect of the whole no future part of it. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that today, we on side opposition, in order to truly win the debate, that we, do, that we don't think that we need, sorry, that we have to prove that we don't need nuclear energy in all aspects of society in order to progress. Also, we're also going to prove, even though it's not our burden to do so, that nuclear energy on a whole is harmful to society. 
All right, let's take a look at what side proposition has just presented us and show you a couple of flaws in their argument today. So first they talk, and really their only point was about how there are no feasible alternatives. First they told us that fossil fuels are running out. Ladies and gentlemen, we see that nuclear energy also isn't renewable. We think that nuclear energy also is going to run out in the future. They've told us that fossil fuels release pollutants into the environment, so does nuclear energy. They release so much radioactive decay, we think that that is technically the same thing too. Also, they've told us renewable energy sources isn't enough, that you first that they can't power a, a car without oil. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we can. We've seen like hundreds of thousands of electric cars we produce, right? Ladies and gentlemen, we don't see that like we actually need oil or like coal or anything to like power these cars. We are finding new alternatives. Then they told us that it costs too much. We mean that nuclear power plants actually cost more because of all the maintenance that has to go with it, because of all the workers that they have to hire, not just the building of the power plant itself. We see that all of these alternatives that are later provide that they are self-sustainable. Also, they've told us that it takes too much space. Ladies and gentlemen, we think that nuclear power plants take even more space than things such as a wind plant or like a solar plant. Why? Because we think that you also have to clear out all of the surrounding area around it so that people can't live there because of the radioactive decay that it is emitting. Lastly, they've told us about the fluctuating weather. They wanted us to reply to this. Sure, we will. We think that, ladies and gentlemen, in a country, it's not going to be solely based on like the sun or solely based on the wind. We know like there's a combination of all of these things. So when there isn't sun, we see that there's at least going to be wind, right, ladies and gentlemen? All right. Let's take a look at my contentions today, and today I'll be talking to you about two things. Firstly, the dangers to society, and secondly, about alternatives as side proposition said we would bring up, and my partner Molik is going to be talking about the whole idea of practicality. All right, let's delve into my first contention today about the dangers to society. So we, under this, we have two subpoints. Firstly, dangers on a national level, and secondly, dangers on an international level. So let's take a look at like this whole idea of what are the dangers on the national level. We think that nuclear power plants within themselves are already dangerous even when they're fully functional. We think that they emit a lot of like uh, radioactive decay. We think that there's a lot of like uh, radiation that is coming out from these plants, which is why a lot of citizen civilians aren't allowed to uh, live around and surrounding these plants for fear of mutations in their genes. But furthermore, we think that what is even more detrimental is when a nuclear power plant explodes or when it leaks, right? We think that not only are the people going to die from the radioactive, uh, sorry, from the explosion within itself, but also they're going to die later because there's going to be mutations into their genes. They're going to grow extra limbs. They're going to develop forms of like cancer, other types of diseases like that. We think that they're going to die in the near future too. But furthermore, in addition to that, we also see that the environment dies as well. We see that in the Chernobyl explosion, that people still aren't allowed to go there, that it's still marked off as a dead zone. And side proposition might tell you that that's too old of an example. But ladies and gentlemen, we see that there are more recent examples too. The 10 Mile Island explosion of New York, the Fukushima explosion of Japan uh, in 2011. We see that sure, technology has progressed, but these types of accidents are still happening, ladies and gentlemen. We see that these areas are still closed off, that the environment, that the people are still being detrimented. All right, let's take a look at the dangers of nuclear energy on an international level. And ladies and gentlemen, we think that when looking at the future, we have to look at the third world developing nations as well. The nations where perhaps they don't have a stable economy, where perhaps they don't have a stable government, perhaps where they don't have the resources to protect themselves. We see that if we give them nuclear energy, having these nuclear energy plants, we don't think that they're going to be able to use this in a safe way. We don't think that they're going to be able to guard them and protect these nuclear power plants from being like kind of like taken over by a lot of terrorist groups, as we see in Pakistan, like we see in Iran, right? We think that a lot of these times that like terrorists would come in, that they're going to take this uh, recreational uh, nuclear uh, like energy and we think that they're going to make them into nuclear missiles, that we think that we're going to use them to uh, like turn them into dangerous things. Sure. Firstly, you cannot use radioactive materials that are used in energy production for nuclear bombs because they're not enriched enough. And, and secondly, I mean, point okay. Thank you. Well, we see that it is enriched enough, right? At least it's enriched uranium is better than no uranium at all. We think that this is even giving like these terrorists a starting mechanism to do things like that. We think that there are other ways that they're going to get around like this whole not enough enrichment, right? All right. Um, let's take a look at uh, this whole idea, my second contention today, about the whole idea of alternatives. So side proposition today had to prove to you that the only way for a future to exist is to have one that includes nuclear energy in it. Ladies and gentlemen, we on side opposition don't see why it has to be nuclear energy when there are so many different other alternatives. We do agree, fossil fuels are bad, but however, we think that there are other forms of energy that can both ensure our future and not pose the same kind of harm and the same type of detriment to the human race as a whole. 
All right, let's take a look at the three options that we have today. First, hydroelectricity. We see that hydroelectricity is a renewable resource that is just solely reliant on the flow of the river. What are the harms to hydroelectricity? Well, really, the only harms are that, that fish could get stuck in the turbines. But other than that, ladies and gentlemen, what are the real benefits that we see to hydroelectricity? We think that, first of all, it's non-pollutant. Second of all, we think that there's no chance of a terrorist getting their hands and using a hydroelectric dam to try to blow up the world. Thirdly, we think that it's cost effective. And fourthly, we think that it's easy to maintain for generations upon generations. All right, what if people don't have water, you may ask? Well, if people don't have water, we propose another alternative to them. We propose solar energy, right? Ladies and gentlemen, we think that solar energy is very simple. You take a solar panel, you get the energy from the sun during the day, you convert the sun rays into electricity that people can use. What are the really the harms to society? What are really the harms that solar energy proposes? Well, it takes up space. However, we've already proved to you that nuclear energy and nuclear power plants actually take up more space. What's the other harm to it? We think that it's more, ex well, it, we think that it's more expensive than Hydro. However, we do think that it is still less expensive than nuclear power plants. Um, what are the benefits of solar energy? Well, again, we see that it's non-pollutant, that it's renewable, and we see that it's easy to maintain. And ladies and gentlemen, you may ask, well, what if you don't have water? And what if you don't have solar energy? What if you don't have the sun? Well, ladies and gentlemen, then where are you on Earth if you don't at least have wind energy, right? I mean, that all nations are going to have this kind of energy in some way, in some form. That like wind energy, it's just like hydroelectric energy. We put the turbine in the air instead of the water, and that it poses the same harms and the same benefits. We think that energy, uh, uh, we think that the energies that are renewable, that are non-pollutant, and that are easy to maintain, those are the energies that have a future. We don't see that nuclear power plants fall under this category, which is why we are so proud to oppose. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there seems to be a clear misunderstanding from team opposition today in our case. We highlighted today that there are problems in nuclear energy. By no means are we doubting that there are problems with nuclear energy. But what we are highlighting in our case today is that with innovation, with scientific development, with all these things today, we will come to a point in time where nuclear energy will be sustainable and will be the future by means of protection, by means of sustaining it, harnessing it to make it uh, not have waste and not pollute the environment. Now, before I get on to my arguments, I would like to do some rebuttal from the team pro um, opposition side. Now, um, they bombarded us with facts or claimed facts of uh, nuclear energy being uh, ridiculously bad to the environment. However, they never looked at the technological advancements on how they are improving. They never looked at scientific development in today's society and how that is contributing to nuclear energy being stored positively and nuclear energy not harming the environment, something I will be going into in my case today. No, thank you. So we never said fusion uh, works at the moment, but we claimed that it was a new innovation that would revolutionize uh, uh, the disposal of nuclear energy. Now, there is no waste in nuclear energy except from water. Now, this is happening in the future. The only problem with this is that we need a high temperature in order to break down the molecules within the uranium. Now, this is... Uh, now this is well on its way to happening, and now this will only lead to water, which will by no means lead to uh, negative waste on the environment. Yes? What about all the radioactive waste that has to be stored in abandoned mines? Okay, now we see that as a... That will lead on to my uh, second argument about the short-term problems. Now, we do have short-term problems with nuclear energy, but with the innovation science offers us with today, we can, uh, we can provide sustainable energy uh, that will last us for years to come. Uh, my speaker even mentioned that um, the uranium would last us 2,000 to 60,000 years uh, if it is truly harnessed with the methods we have today. Now, uh, the opposition also talked about Chernobyl uh, and Fukushima. 
Now, these are only two events in history where nuclear energy has posed a major threat on the people. Now, they have taken a complete subjective stance, obviously, as they are the team opposition. However, they have taken a completely subjective stance by only highlighting the negative aspects. However, I will open up this broad aspect today and show you the positive impacts. Yes, sir. Now, we don't see that the meltdowns will happen in the future if we carry on at this scientific development, as we have mentioned. We have offered you with ideas of fusion uh, that will revolutionize, uh, that will revolutionize the waste, uh, waste disposal of nuclear energy. No, thank you, which I will be going into on my, second, uh, on my substantive arguments. Uh, now, getting on to my arguments. Our first argument, uh, our first, uh, my first argument is that uh, the only alternative in the developing world is nuclear energy. Now they pose that, okay, there's always water. Okay, there's always wind. Regardless of wherever you are, you have to be on Earth in order to have these things. Now, we ask you, okay, this all th seems theoretical. This all seems, uh, this all seems like it makes sense. But now we're asking you, how do you, uh, how do you expect to go to these developing countries in Africa, in South Africa, bring in solar panels, bring in wind panels, and uh, place it in the country. We find this to be very inefficient. We find this not to work. We find this to be a theoretical thing that will be very hard and complicated to achieve. Yes? Okay, then how do you propose that we go into like, these third world nations in Africa and like, install and build a nuclear power plant? It's the same theory. Well, like, if we do go into these like places, then we can see that the, uh, there is uranium vast around the country. Uranium is accessible around the entire world now renewable energy is not no thank you is not because we need to create it we need to make these machinery in order to put it in the country now uranium is a natural resource that is found around the entire world now that can be accessible renewable energy cannot no thank you um, uh, developing my argument on it is the only alternative to the developing world as we mentioned uh, these developing worlds find themselves in uh, uh, extreme bad circumstances. They can barely provide for their food. They can barely provide for medicine. They don't have these necessities. And now they're saying, okay, we're going to invest in millions and millions of these expensive renewable methods that are only popular in the Western world. And we will put them in these developing worlds. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we find this completely outrageous because uranium is found uh, across the entire world. And why can we not use this as a sustainable method? Yes, both of you at once. If as your first speaker stated, it costs $4 billion to create a power plant and it's only the last for 20 Years. How exactly is it okay, 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 okay. $4 billion. Now, if you look at that and you look at the energy it uh, produces, now look, at soul, uh, now look at renewable energy. All these methods, there is no doubt that all these methods um, are very expensive. Now, renewable energy only contributes to 1% of energy in the world, even less than 1%. Now, how are you implying that we take these expensive methods and we put them in developing worlds and then uh, we create energy that will be sustainable for the entire population? Now, we see uranium, as the, uh, um, uranium and nuclear energy as the best alternative because even though it is an investment, the, new, uh, the energy that it gives back is more beneficial than renewable energy that only gives 1%. Yes? But in your case, where we see nuclear energy, we have seen like examples of now, as we mentioned, this is just a minor case of things. We see the benefits of nuclear energy to definitely outweigh the limitations of it. Nuclear energy, as mentioned, is an innovation of the future. Nuclear energy will revolutionize, uh, will revolutionize the energy industry, and it is accessible to everyone, regardless of if you're from Africa, regardless of if you're from Sweden, and regardless of if you're from Canada. No, thank you. Now, um, uh, on to my second argument on how if we abandoned um, nuclear energy, how it would lead to less scientific development and it will completely ruin the nuclear energy industry. Like there is no doubt today that nuclear energy has um, positive things. Now we see if this motion passes today, if we do what team opposition proposes, then there will be no development and no emphasis put on nuclear energy. Now what does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? That means there will be no more fusion. That means there will be no more forms of waste that will be able to, um, 
that we'll be able to dispose of it properly. That means that we will completely ignore this, focus on renewable energy that is not a long-term solution, as mentioned, 2,000, 6,000 years, and that is not efficient, as mentioned, only 1%, uh, but rather would not have a sustainable future. Uh, by, adding em by adding emphasis on realizing that nuclear energy is the future, we are able to make this more efficient in forms of fission and fusion. Now, fission is a short-term method, as we mentioned. However, what we see uh, a prospect of the future is definitely fusion and these other methods of disposing it properly. Now, they do have minor impacts on today's society because of scientific development, as we mentioned. There is a thorium project where they avoid uh, making nuclear waste harmful, as mentioned, as uh, 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 avoiding uh, making nuclear harm, making nuclear harm, as we mentioned in our case. And now, the long term is also f fusion, as we mentioned throughout our case numerous times. Now, if the government and cooperations like CERN and all these work together, then we will have a sustainable future by developing more investments, make it environmentally friendly, and this will be a better alternative than renewable energy. That is why we say this motion must pass today. We think where side proposition failed within, within their burden today was to prove to us why exactly nuclear power is so essential to our future that we should swallow the harms. Why exactly is nuclear power so important, so essential to, for nations to progress that one, we should just disband or that we shouldn't focus on other forms of energy. We heard small things arise from the proposition. We can harness 10% more energy. It's a lot more cheaper. Not only do we believe that this is false, but we still believe that that's not enough for us to swallow harms. And that's something I'm going to be really harping on in my debate today. And further, I'm going to be bringing forward the third constructive point, the idea of practicality. But before I do that, let's get into what they have told us today. The first point we heard was about how there's no feasible alternatives and this whole idea of fossil fuels. We're focusing on renewable energies, however, and we don't think fossil fuels are renewable energy, so we just reject that. We don't think fossil fuels is a good idea for our future anyway. But let's talk about renewable forms of energy. We think it's so much better to have hydroelectric dams, so much better to have solar panels. And we believe that for a, a numerous reasons, which is going to come out later on. No, thank you. We heard this idea of oil, how we can't power cars. We have two main responses. One, how exactly with nuclear energy do we power cars? And two, we see new innovation coming forward without the use of nuclear energy, like hybrid cars, which require batteries. Moreover, so let's talk about some of the bigger points in the debate today, no, thank you, about how one, renewable energy is dependent on the environment. We don't think all renewable energies are dependent on the environment. Hydroelectric dams only require a water source. Moreover, we find it ironic that they talk about innovation because there has been innovation within the solar pa panel industry where they're able to store the energy that you get from the sun and use it during times of night. So we don't think it's dependent on the environment, no thank you. Let's talk about energy density. They never told us a couple of things. One, why is efficient? Why is uh, more efficient energy needed? And why is it better to have like when we have so many forms of energy that we can use? Why is it better just to have like 10% more energy? Sure, it makes it more efficient, but is it worth the lives that could be lost in a meltdown? They never proved that. They never proved how, when, even within their own speech, when they talk about benefits outweighing the way risks, why exactly do the benefits outweigh the risks? Maybe they could outline it right now. Speaking of deaths and meltdowns and so forth, are you aware that in all meltdowns in the history of nuclear energy, there have been only about like 17? No, we don't believe that at all. We think in, 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 in Japan, when a tsunami hit and there was so much radiation, we saw so much radioactivity, we saw mutations and we saw deaths. We saw that they couldn't eat the food within those areas because it was all radioactive and they couldn't drink the water. We see that this caused a lot more deaths than what you're trying to say, but moreover, it was, it was ultimately harmful to the people. So we reject that. Let's talk about the second premise, so about innovation. And we find it ironic that they talked about it because they said, well, we can innovate the nuclear facilities. And that was actually something that they used to respond to our point. Well, we have a couple of responses to this. One, why exactly can we innovate right now, and why don't why don't we try to innovate the renewable resources of energies that we have? Well, and furthermore, we see innovation of it. We see that if uh, we see that there's some factors that you cannot control. You cannot control natural disasters. If you have a nuclear facility and a natural disaster occurs, that nuclear facility will melt down. One, there's no safeguard against that, and two, we think that's inevitable. And we saw examples of that, like in Japan, where this harms people. Exactly, how do you help that with factors that you cannot control? More 
Moreover, we heard this idea of how nuclear energy is cheap. I'm going to be directly rebutting that within my constructive about how it's not a practical solution, primarily because for developing countries, they don't have the necessary resources to uh, maintain nuclear facilities. Exactly what do they say to our point? So thank you. First point, we said nuclear energy, nuclear energy is dangerous, and this is a huge premise within our point. The only thing we heard was that while there's development, there's improvements happening, this prevents meltdowns. First thing, third world nations do not have this luxury. They wanted to bring up third world nations within their second point. Tell us exactly how third world nations have this innovation, have this development, have the ability to have nuclear, no thank you, have nuclear facilities within their countries and have the ability to sustain those nuclear facilities, have the ability to protect those nuclear facilities from terrorism. Ironically, a point they did not, uh, they did not re reject. They just said, well, how are they going to use it to build weapons? We see plutonium is a huge thing that happens in nuclear facilities and that's the key ingredient in building nuclear okay, missiles. So. We see that, okay, sure, this, this, we said, sure, this happens in minority cases, no thank you, but we would say uh, uh, some terrorist group or some organization having a nuclear uh, missile or having the ability to make it because of plutonium is a huge risk that we cannot simply outweigh and when that occurs we cannot allow that to, and we shouldn't allow third world nations to have uh, this happening within their nations and I talked about how we can't control environmental things like natural disasters and moreover the innovation analysis about before how we how we should focus on innovating right now renewable resources because they don't pose the same harms as nuclear energy we be, therefore believe we should be supplementing and innovating those things and helping make those more uh, efficient or as efficient as nuclear energy. The last thing we heard was in the minority of cases. Let's really analyze the examples that we brought forward. Chernobyl was a case where we had good, a well-constructed nuclear facility, where we had good scientists working in it, but it still melted down and harmed a lot of people. Tell us exactly how right now your nuclear facilities won't have the same harm and how you can guarantee that that won't happen. Yes. Actually, experts who studied the case of Chernobyl said that the fact that it melted down was because of terrible Soviet maintenance of plants, which does not occur the status quo in the modern Okay, but, we, but then again, we see new examples propping up every time. The 10 Mile Island example in New York was an example of a developed nation having a nuclear facility which melted down and hurt people. And now that's an area which people can't live in because there's a huge radioactivity problem. We see that these things are happening within our world and we see that we need to prevent that. We think innovation within our right now with renewable resources is a better case. The second thing we heard about was alternatives. All they said to this was the alternative Alternatives can't happen within, develop, within developing nations. We simply say, how exactly are you going to get nuclear facilities in with, within developing nations? How exactly are developing nations going to be able to sustain them? They just said uranium is accessible. We find it ironic that they bring forward uranium because uranium is a limited resource. It's a limited resource within our nations. So how exactly is uranium going to be able to sustain us in the future when it can run out? No, thank you. No, thank you. So we think that how exactly is uranium going to sustain us for many, many years to come when it is a limited resource within our planet by renewable resources can be used all the time, but moreover, we don't see it's accessible to everyone, and we still don't think that uh, general nations will be able to build nuclear power plants. We would do my constructive point today about practicality. So as side opposition, we not only feel that nuclear energy is a non-essential solution, a detrimental solution, but we feel that it's simply not a practical solution for all nations and for our future. Let's analyze why. Now, applying to all nations of the world, regardless whether it's a developing nation or a developed nation, we see a huge problem of nuclear waste. Now, what uh, we think nuclear waste is an inevitable detriment of using nuclear reactors. Now, why is nuclear waste harmful? One, we feel nuclear waste is really highly radioactive and dangerous to the people. And we see that the more you have nuclear facilities, the more you prop them up because you're saying that they're better for our future, the more nuclear waste we have. This leads, me to my, this leads me to my second harm, that it's really hard to get rid of nuclear waste. You can't bury it because one, it ruins the soil, two, you simply can't bury it because it will leak out and, and create radioactive environments, and moreover, you can't destroy it because once again, that releases the radioactivity uh, aspect of it. So we see that a future with nuclear energy is a future with more indisposable nuclear waste, but moreover dangerous nuclear waste. It's dangerous primarily because how exactly are developing nations going to solve this problem when developed nations for 60 years haven't been able to solve this problem of nuclear waste. We see nuclear energy is not a practical solution for our future because there's no way today to effectively dispose of this and we see that innovation isn't occurring in, within this uh, aspect because we've had 60 years of it and developed nations haven't been able to solve it. The second reason we feel this is an impractical solution because of the money needed to sustain nuclear energies, apply more to developing nations. In order to sustain nuclear energy, you need security of the reactor. You need maintenance of the reactor. Effectively ha having the ability to take care of nuclear waste, so you're not just dumping it into water and killing a lot of people. And moreover, they need safeguards. We, they need to have some certain safeguards against terrorist organizations, some safeguards against meltdowns. And we don't think on an economic basis, this is on an economic basis, this is practical sus to sustain within developing nations. We feel for many reasons, and for the reasons that we will even further bring forward on our opposition case, we are very proud to oppose the case today.
opposition and before the opposition is weak. I assume everyone here has heard of a little country called Denmark. We are very well known in the international community for our production of wind power. And while it's true we have one of the biggest productions of wind power uh, in the world, few people actually realize how little that actually means. The wind power only accounts for 10% of Denmark's whole energy production, whereas nuclear energy accounts for somewhere between 20 and 30%. Um, we just don't believe... Um, so now, now Denmark is one of the more developed countries in the world. The countries we proved should be able to rely on renewable energy, if any, um, yet they can't even rely on these sources. Uh, so this is one of the main points that I'm going to go into today. Um, so I'm going to try to do a stakeholder share, looking at um, the effects that this motion, passing this motion, will have on the developed countries, and secondly on the developing countries, proving how it's going to be better for both, um, both types of countries, and generally the whole world, to let this motion pass today. But first of all, I'm going to clear two points that team opposition have misunderstood today. Uh, first of all, they've been talking about all these accidents and so on. Well, there haven't really been a huge loss of lives. As my first speaker mentioned, the total amount of deaths from nuclear accidents um, uh, at nuclear power plants has been around 100. No thank you. Um, and then we also propose that they mentioned, for example, in um, Japan, when there was an earthquake and it hit the, the nuclear plant. Well, our, our proposal to that is to not build in earthquake zones, as this is clearly dangerous. No thank you. We believe this is very easy to avoid, and this is not a major problem. Team opposition has yet to prove how this is a big problem. Um, secondly, the, the second speaker mentioned how uh, we, we conceded that uh, uranium is a finite resource. Yes, we did, our first speaker said, but we also said thousands of years, which we define to be the future. Scientists have said uh, between 2,000 and 60,000 years. We on Team Proposition believe this is the future today. I don't know if Team Opposition disagrees with this. Uh, but now moving in to uh, the stakeholder share that I'm going to look at today. First of all, I'm going to look at the developed countries and afterwards uh, the developing countries. So starting with uh, the developed countries, team opposition have mainly talked about uh, the dangers that it proposes to the, the, the developed countries and how they are against this now. Uh, France is stopping all, uh, closing down all their power plants and so on. Well, um, I would like to look at several of the accidents that we've had, you know, over, over the last, like, in the history of, of nuclear power plants. Chernobyl, 50, 56 people died. Fukushima, about a dozen people died. The Three Mile Island, no deaths at all. So we believe, no thank you, we believe there's very little risk, and you can solve the few risks that there are, as my second speaker mentioned, I'll take him in, as my second speaker mentioned, with more development of this technology, and uh, be more careful with where we place power plants. Yes? How can you have a future with the kind of energy that you can't build any, anywhere on the world where there might be a fault on the Earth's tectonic plates? And how can you have a future second over when if there's any minor disaster, you're not allowed to go anywhere near that area? Well, we still believe that you're able to go around this area. We believe that if you have more development, as my second speaker mentioned, you will be able to make more safe power plants that have no pollution at all and very limited. We mentioned uh, ways of getting rid of this waste, for example, placing it in salt mines and so on, which has very little uh, exposure uh, to uranium. So we believe there are solutions to these problems, whereas Team Opposition have yet to mention any ways in which renewable energy will actually be able to take up the market today and propose a future, which is sort of the point of this motion. Uh, but now moving on, yeah, continuing with the developed countries. They talked only about the dangers they proposed. Well, we look at the potential benefits which they haven't responded to. It would likely provide cheap and renewable energy, as we are way too reliant on, on fossil fuels today, as my, as my first speaker already mentioned. Um, the cost of renewable energies approximate today is 2 US dollars per kilowatt, whereas uh, the cost of nuclear energy is about 25 cents per, kilo per, per kilowatt. This is much more beneficial for these uh, developed countries and it's much more cheaper, it's much, much cheaper for them, it's much more cheaper energy. Whereas if we focus on renewable energy, it's going to be much more expensive for them. Now we believe cheap energy is good. I don't know what team opposition has to say about this. Um, so, you know, as stated in my intro, uh, you know, develop, if anyone, developed countries should be able to use this, but they don't, because we proved, no thank you, we proved how it is much more beneficial, even for the developed countries that should be able to use this, this technology. Um, we believe we won this clash today. Uh, so now moving on to the, looking at the, 
No, sorry. Uh, continuing with the developed countries, they also talked about no thank you. They also talked about how uh, these things don't need to be effective all year round because you're going to have different types of them. Well, okay. Imagine in a country, for, for example, Sweden, where we have sun about uh, two months of the year. Then let's say we build some solar, solar, solar. Um, solar panels. They're going to work for two months. And then for the other 10 months, we're going to rely on, let's say, wind power. Then we also need to build windmills. So we're going to have solar panels, which are effective two months of the year. We're going to have wind panels, which are effective the other half. This is just overall very ineffective in the, and very increased cost. And as we already talked about, it takes up a lot of space. Uh, if we wanted to power, uh, if you wanted as much power as you get from one nuclear plant, you would have to have solar panels that take up about as much space as the whole of New York City. So we believe this is going to take up a lot of space and you're going to need a lot more of it for it to be effective all year round. Yes? Okay, but you're creating a false dichotomy. You're saying we can only have this or the other. We're saying that you can have both just because you have solar Yes, thank you. As I just said, having both is going to be much more expensive and taking up much more space. We're going to have these solar panels that don't work, you know, half of the year. They only work one half of the year. The other half of the year, they're just taking up space, space that could be used for the overpopulation we're going to be facing. As my first speaker already mentioned, you know, we're increasing this and we actually need more energy for these people. Well, now you're proposing that all of this energy should take up more and more space um, and we're just not going to have enough living space for people as well. Overall, it's just very inefficient well, in, and ineffective what team opposition have proposed. But now moving on to looking at the developing countries um, and how it's going to affect them. And our team proposition, we've talked about how uh, in these countries they can't really afford renewable energy, which we think is very true. We don't see very much renewable energy in developing countries. It's too expensive. And they can't, uh, as I mentioned, developed countries can't even rely on this. So how do they propose developing countries are going to rely on renewable energy today? Um, you know, uh, they need... Um they need, the, they need energy for development, and we provide them with this energy through nuclear energy. Um, their only response to this was the fact that it was too expensive to build a plant. It cost uh, four billion. Well, we say that, first of all, this is cheaper than renewable energy, uh, and it pays for itself over the 25 to 40 years. So it'll probably pay for itself, no thank you, it'll probably pay for itself within five years, and it's going to last for even longer. So it's a long-term investment in these countries. It's going to last for a long, long time. Now, they also had this small point about uh, terrorist groups in, um, in these uh, developing countries now. They can't protect this. Well, first of all, I'd like to say this has never happened before. Uh, and secondly, um, the plants in uranium mines are very heavily guarded. And thirdly, you can't extract uranium rods out and just start using them for bombs randomly. This is, this is just basic science the team opposition have tried to oppose today. And we haven't really uh, heard a proper explanation of how this is going to work for them. Uh, so because we've explained how it's going to be better, first of all, for the developed countries, which if anyone, yeah, should be using this renewable energy, but they're not in today's society because it's ineffective, it's inefficient, and nuclear energy is so much better. Uh, and because we've also explained how it's much better for the develop developing countries who really need this energy uh, so they can actually develop and become uh, more developed countries. Whereas team opposition, ha um, they haven't actually explained how renewable energy can... Uh, can solve this global energy demand in the future. We believe we won this motion today. Thank you. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, all side proposition is really done, has just said, well, we can't have renewable energy, so that means that therefore we need to have nuclear energy. We reject this on two bases. One, we can have renewable energy. Two, even if we couldn't, that doesn't mean that nuclear energy is the alternative. I'm going to break this debate down to two main themes. First, about safety. Second, about future. And by breaking this debate down to those two themes, I'll show you exactly how we've won this debate down the bench on side opposition today, and how really side Sweden hasn't actually given us that big of a response to any of our main contentions, and hasn't really tried to reconstruct a lot of their contentions either. First, safety. So we see that right away, side of Sweden got up to us and said, you know what, you know what, we see that nuclear power plants are very safe. We see that they're safe for the environment because they don't hit the ozone layer like fossil fuels do. And then they drop the, and then they just stopped talking about it. First of all, we never claim that they do harm the ozone layer. However, we do claim and we do know that they do harm the surrounding environment around it. They pollute the water sources. They pollute the environment around it. They make the food, no thank you, they make the food sources around it unlivable and uneatable, undrinkable. The, 
how do they do this? By radioactive de decay. There's still no good way to store radioactive waste inside an area. No, thank you. They tried to get up to us today and say, oh, we can put them in abandoned salt mines. Ladies and gentlemen, this still doesn't work. This still uses a lot of space. This still harms the environment around it. So we don't actually see how this is good for our safety. What did we bring to you today? We told you how they're basically how the harms outweigh any of the benefits. If you're able to extract 10% more of the energy than the than the renewable energy, that's it's, quite frankly that's not worth the risk of a meltdown like we saw happen in Fukushima, one of the most advanced technological countries on Earth. Japan, one of the most advanced scientific communities on Earth. Japan was able to have this kind of a disaster happen to it. What was their response to this? Don't build a nuclear power plant where an earthquake could happen. Ladies and gentlemen, an earthquake could happen almost anywhere. You can't actually just avoid a disaster. There could be a hurricane that could come. There could be a tornado that could come. Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, we don't know what could happen in this regard. We don't see how this small benefit outweighs this huge risk. They try to say, oh, well, you know, only 57 people died in Chernobyl. That number is actually more around 700, ladies and gentlemen. And not only did that, not only when that happened, what did the area immediately surrounding it become un unlivable? for many years, including right now, where we're still not allowed in that part of the Ukraine, but that it actually went, the, traveled through the air and even hit back home where we live back in Vancouver, where we could actually detect radioactive levels in our mountains after the Chernobyl accident. We don't see how this is good for the world on a whole. No, no, thank you. Now, we really don't see, again, when it comes down to safety, how we see this no future aspect. They really still, down their bench today, we expected, at least by the third speaker, that they would talk about the whole idea of no future. What exactly does that mean? Well, Grace got up to you today and said, basically what no future means is that you have to have nuclear energy in order for development to happen. They haven't proved this burden. No no one of their speakers actually tried to say that you need to have, a nu that you need to have nuclear energy so that you can develop in the world, so that the world can have a future. We haven't seen this come out, maybe I'll see it in this POI. Yeah, we actually looked at developing countries, how many proposed they, um, they develop more renewable energy. Okay, thank you very much. So this go leads directly to my theme of future. So the, basically their second speaker got up and for his entire constructive said, you can't put a wind power plant on a developing country because it costs so much and it takes so much land. Well then ladies and gentlemen, how is a developing country like Mali going to afford four billion dollars to make, to make it so that they can have the nuclear power plant? How is a developing country like Nigeria going to be able to afford this money? How, no thank you. How is a developing country like Uganda going to be able to get this kind of money? No thank you. So we don't actually, so we don't actually see how this stands. We don't actually see how exactly they're being, they can just say, well you can't have renewable energy, therefore you can have nuclear energy. No ladies and gentlemen. Even if we bought their analysis that you can have renewable energy, which we don't buy because A, we see that you can extract the wind and the solar and the hydro from wherever it comes from. We see that that's definitely an abundant resource, uh, more abundant therefore than uranium, which is in a lot of countries. But B, even if that was true, we would see that a nuclear power plant is more expensive in the short term to build. We see that a nuclear power plant can't be built just willy-nilly and we don't and we see that they don't have the proper tools to protect the waste from going everywhere. We don't see that developing countries have the proper tools to create a future for the world. And since these developing countries are the future of the world and they, we, they need to prove this burden that it will work in all aspects of society, they've lost the debate. Moving on, we see that really, so in their, so those were their main two arguments that came out, was basically there's no feasible alternatives and the feasible alternatives don't work in developing countries. So nowhere in their two contentions that they presented you today did they actually tell you why is nuclear energy the best response. However, they did try to do it in some refutation. So for example, no thank you, when we talked to you about the, alter, when we talked to you about um, practicality, for example, how it's not practical to have a nuclear power plant in a developing nation because for, exa because for example, there's no security Security. It's, you know, we've had 60 years to have scientific developments and they still haven't happened. We've had all, we've had all this time and really we haven't seen a lot of innovation from nuclear power plants. What did they say to this? Well, you know what? Denmark has 10% wind and 20% nuclear energy. Therefore, we should be prioritizing nuclear energy over wind energy. A few responses to this. No, thank you. First, we see that Denmark isn't, doesn't have a lot of land mass, so they don't have a lot of room to have a lot of wind energy. Second, we see that, uh, sure. Yeah, then one of the biggest producers of wind power today. Yeah, it's still only such a small part. Thank you very much. We don't actually buy that they're one of the biggest wind producers of today. We actually see that the United States is the biggest wind producer, followed by China, followed by India. We don't actually see that Denmark falls underneath any of these categories. We don't actually see that a lot of European nations have actually bought into uh, making wind power into one of their biggest resources. So this is just a false assertion that's come out of side proposition. Like a lot of what they said today, like how they've said that, you know what, uranium doesn't actually pollute the land, uranium can't be used in or uranium is just you know all overall just the miracle substance that we have. 
So we don't actually see how any of these things stand. Now they try to say, oh, well, you know what? Why should we build both solar and wind at the same time? Because that'll cost more than a nuclear power plant. First, they still haven't proven how the benefits outweigh the harms. So we still would say that the, because of the harms, that's why we would do it, even if it cost a little more money. Second, we still don't see how you can have a nuclear power plant in a developing country. So the two kilo, so the two dollars per kilowatt hour that it would cost for a renewable instead of the twenty five cents. Well, that's because you can only pay the two dollars because you can only have the renewable in the developing country. You can't have the nuclear power plant in the developing country. And if you can, they still haven't proved it down the bench today. And they only have a four minute speech left to do it. I don't think they'll be able to do it by then. So next we see that, you know what, if you don't want to have both, then fine, you can stick to one. For example, in Sweden, the Sweden has a lot of rivers. Sweden has a lot of areas where you can just put in a hydroelectric dam. No, thank you. Protected time, sir. So we don't actually see how you can just say, oh, well, you know, we only get sun for two months of the year. Therefore, we should never use renewable energy ever again. We see that a lot of developed nations already recognize that nuclear energy is not the future. My partner Grace's example of France, who, bought, who immediately saw after the Fukushima disaster that we can't use nuclear energy in order to have a sustainable future. What did side proposition say to this? Uh, it doesn't matter. We know better than the government. We know better than what they're saying. We know better than the experts that have analyzed this. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to sustain our safety, we, need, we need, can't have a resource like nuclear energy, which hurts our environment, which hurts our international policy. Oh, and they try to say that terrorists has never tried to take it before. We see that in Libya. They tried to take over a nuclear power plant in 1990s. We saw that. We saw this happen in Seville just recently, where France had to intervene, where they tried to take over a uranium enrichment plant. We don't actually buy into this whole thing how there won't be international terrorists. Anyways, for safety, we see that on the international level and the environment level, we can't allow this. We see that on the future because you can't develop with nuclear energy in the developing world and the developed world refuses to use it anymore, that this motion that this house believes that there is no future without nuclear energy must and will fall. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, today we on side opposition have summed the debate down into three key questions. Number one, what is better for the citizens? Number two, can renewable energy contest nuclear energy? And number three, what is better for the developing world? And without further ado, let's take a look at my first question today about what is better for the citizens. And side proposition today has told you that nuclear energy is better for the citizens, that it gives them energy and it gives them cheap energy. But ladies and gentlemen, we on side opposition would question is producing 10% more energy and making it a couple of cents cheaper really more important than the thousands, hundreds of lives that could be lost in the process of doing so? We firmly believe that the answer to that is no. Also, a side proposition doesn't think that the nuclear power plants are going to explode or, we, or going to leak. Ladies and gentlemen, we've told you that yes, that they are going to do exactly this. We mean that there's no way to prevent a natural disaster from happening. And even the most earthquake prone buildings today are still only prone to a 7.0 natural disaster or an earthquake. And that it's not actually possible for everybody to build these nuclear power plants that is not on a fault line. We said that this would exclude all the islands, all the countries around the Ring of Fire. But furthermore, in addition to that, we see that it's not only just earthquakes that could potentially destroy these uh, nuclear power plants. We see other things, such as tornadoes, such as hurricanes, such as all of these other natural disasters that could happen, that could destroy it, right? And that there are natural disasters everywhere around the world that it's not something that the human civilization can prevent. Also, they said that there actually aren't a a lot of deaths caused. We take huge contention to this, meaning that there are actually like hundreds of deaths that have been lost, but furthermore, there were even more hundreds of deaths that were uh, caused as a result of this from the mutation of the genes, perhaps not directly. All right, let's take a look at my second question today about can renewable energy contest nuclear energy? And they've told you that no, that renewable resources are only useful some parts of the year. And they've told you that you can only like use wind energy for like eight months and then solar energy for another two months. Ladies and gentlemen, we take huge contention to this, and that that is a false dichotomy that they're presenting, and that the renewable energy sources are workable all year round, and that in the case of solar energy, even if there isn't a lot of sun that's coming through, that they're actually equipped to take in even like the minutest rays of sun. So we think that in that case, that it actually is very effective, that these uh, new renewable energy sources actually work together and work all throughout the year together to produce the energy that is needed. 
Also, they proposed how to get rid of nuclear waste. My partner, Omolik, has already talked to us about how this isn't practical. We think that it will leak, that even if it, it doesn't leak, that it's still going to stay on the Earth and it's going to be detrimental for our future generations. All right, let's take a look at my last and final question today about what is better for the developing nation. And side proposition has tried to convince you that it gives them a way to purchase energy because it's cheap and about why this is good. Ladies and gentlemen, two responses to this. First, the idea of supply and demand. If we get rid of nuclear energy, or if we stop relying on it so much and we rely more on these renewable energy sources, if we suddenly build a lot more, then we think that the energy that is being produced out of it is going to be cheaper. We think that these developing nations are going to be able to afford this. And we think, think that this works because, as we pointed out, renewable energy sources, they're renewable. They're not going to run out. Secondly, we don't think that we should be placing the burden of making them take care of a nuclear power plant when they don't have the ability to do so. Um, side proposition today has brought up in their speech, and as I mentioned in a peer why like they tried to tell you how we'd be like imposing like a huge burden on these countries by building renewable energy sources there because it takes up a lot of space ladies and gentlemen we think that nuclear power plants take up the same amount of space that they take on the same amount of burden for the developing nations we don't see that like they've really come up with a response for this but furthermore we've told you that terrorists can get their hands on this nuclear energy if it's put in developing nations because these developing nations don't have the military they don't have the security they don't have the safety to safeguard against this as we pointed out in the example of Libya, right? Lastly, they told us that renewable resources take up a lot of space, so we shouldn't be putting them there. Ladies and gentlemen, that nuclear power plants do the exact same thing. In the end, we don't think that side proposition has proved exactly why nuclear energy is the better alternative and why the benefits outweigh the harms. That was their burden today. They have improved it, which is why we on side opposition have won the debate. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I took physics in high school. And I, the one part that I very, very much so enjoyed was the part of, about, about atomic and nuclear physics. And our, our very own physics teacher told us about the benefits of nuclear energy and about many of the environmentalists that we see today are actually very much exaggerating the harms and risks that we have. Made. And we think that this is exactly what Team Opposition has been doing today. Team Opposition has told us that there's no hope for nuclear energy because we have seven years of development and they have caused meltdowns and so forth. And therefore, you know what? Since it has caused these things, we should just abandon it and maybe focus on the uh, renewables. And the second point about the renewables that they brought up and they so much focused on, well, we thought it was good, right? Because renewables virtually have little risk and produce little harm. But the fact of the matter is that what we are trying to stress was that renewables are simply not enough for a growing population with a growing energy demand, and especially since it's very expensive compared to nuclear energy. Like, the problem that they had with this is that they actually didn't prove to us how renewable energy was enough. They just assume if we combine all nuclear, I'm sorry, all renewable energy sources together, there'll be enough for the whole future and so forth. Now, this is where they have lost the debate. But, you know what, let's divide this debate up into two parts. Firstly, whether nuclear energy is efficient enough or uh, whether uh, renewables are efficient enough to maintain the global energy demand, and secondly, about safety, whether we can have nuclear energy in the future uh, because w and whether it is safe enough. So let's go into this efficiency part. Like we told you in our first, in our first prop speech that uh, nuclear energy or uranium has the highest energy density compared to any other thing on this planet, and therefore it would be the most efficient thing to use. It would, it would be completely a waste just to leave it there and not use it, right? Secondly, we told you how it's extremely cheap and it costs eight times as little as, as uh, renewable sources. All they told us to us, you know what, it'll be worth it because we have no risks, right? We don't see this as a valid response. Then they told us, you know what, nuclear energy or nuclear plants are super expensive for developing countries. Well, we you know what, my third speaker told you how these nuclear power plants pay for themselves within like five years. So we do not see a problem in these developing countries investing in nuclear power plants because we believe that these re if they re uh, invest in renewables, Instead, these renewable, uh, uh, renewable power plants will not pay for themselves. Now, later we have this idea about uh, uh, how about renewables, you know, they only work in predictable weather conditions and so forth. You know, they told us, you know, let's, uh, yet again, combine all renewable energy sources, high, hydroelectric power, wind, solar, and put them in one place and just, you know, hope that when we have sun, the solar panel works, and when we don't have sun, we have the wind power works. Well, yet again, this is the point we're stressing. That does not mean that it is enough to harness enough energy for the rest of mankind for, for the future, right? Simply because you assume that, you know, you have more energy sources at once, you'll have enough for the rest of rest of time is just a completely logical fallacy. Now, let's move on to this point about uh, 
is safety, right? We already told you how there's little, little problem with nuclear energy because we can, we can develop waste management in the future for scientific discovery. And secondly, we already have the thorium project and salt mines that, uh, that you know, efficiently take care of this waste, right? Then we also told you how if we develop and continue nuclear energy in terms of fusion and we find a material that can contain a fusion reaction's uh, temperature, we'll actually have no waste whatsoever and we'll uh, actually literally, I mean literally solve the world energy problem. Team opposition opposed this as idea. Then later we had this idea about mail towns and deaths. You know, the fact of the matter is, and I think I'll told you this, there have been only three events in like 70 years that actually caused meltdowns. We'd see this as I said it's sort of terrible, but it's not bad enough that we should completely abandon nuclear energy for all of time, right? We already told you that the deaths did not exceed the thousands. And although there are, you know, spillover effects on terms of the area around it, we see that most nuclear power plants, you know what? They're not in cities, right? This is just a blatant obvious fact. So you won't have that many casualties. And the point about terrorist groups is completely absurd. My third speaker went through this in his rebuttal. First of all, we told you these things never happened. The third speaker said, you know what? In Libya, they went into the power plant. But you know what he failed to acknowledge is that never, never, ever happened the terrorists use these nuclear materials against the people. Secondly, we told you how these things are heavily protected and therefore the risk of the terrorists taking care of them is minimal. And when it comes to nuclear missiles, I think the entire point how we can use you know, the nuclear rods from power plants to nuclear missiles is completely scientifically false. I mean, you, know, you can just go into Google and Google how you, know, you can make a dirty bomb, maybe that does little harm, but you cannot actually make nuclear missiles with something in a nuclear power plant. For the reasons the opposition did not prove to us, that their burden, we have won this debate. Thank <laughs> you.